Questions 1 to 6. Good afternoon, East Coast Community College. How may I help you? Good afternoon. My name's Sonia Stamp. I wonder if you could give me some information about your courses. Certainly. And perhaps help me make a choice. I'll see what I can do. What were you thinking of studying, Sonia? Well, a while ago I started a bachelor's degree in accounting, but I only completed the first year. I'd like to study again, only this time something a bit more creative. Then you've come to the right place. We've got courses in drawing, painting, photography, music, dance and drama. I'm not sure I could make a career out of those, although I'm not bad at drawing. Yes, it's not easy to earn a living as an artist. Still, if you like drawing, why not consider graphic design or desktop publishing? To tell the truth, I'm not sure what desktop publishing is. It's creating leaflets or brochures for advertising, or even entire books. You manipulate the text and images on your computer. We've got some really good tutors on that course, and lots of our students get work afterwards. That sounds interesting. Where could I study desktop publishing? There's a beginner's course at East Lakes, and we've just started one at the Randwick Community Centre. Really? That's close by. I could walk from home. Wait a minute. The Randwick course is a series of weekend workshops. You'd have to give up Saturdays and Sundays. Oh, that's no good. I waitress on Saturday, and I need that income. Tell me about the course at East Lakes. East Lakes? Oh, sorry, that course has been filled and there are already two people on the waiting list. No problem. Have you thought about web design? Yes, I have. My cousin, who makes jewellery, wants to set up an online business. We've been talking about setting up our own website for ages. Because these courses are so popular, you'd have to pay straight away. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 7 to 10. So, Sonia, you've chosen web design. Yes. Just one more thing. How familiar would I need to be with computers before I start? According to the information here, you need good keyboarding skills and a working knowledge of the Windows environment. I've got both of those, but I'm not sure about my cousin. I'd like to study web design at your Randwick Centre. Is that possible? I'm afraid our courses there are full. Another option is a daytime class. Do you have any commitments on weekdays? I'm busy on Mondays and Tuesdays. OK. There's a course at Daisyville on Fridays at noon for two hours. It runs from August to November for 13 weeks. That's a fairly long time, 13 weeks. I mean, long enough to really learn something. Yes, I agree. So, shall I put you down for web design at Daisyville? Ah, I'm new to this area and I'm not sure where Daisyville is. Could you spell it for me and I'll look it up? It's Daisyville. D-A-C-E-Y-V-I-L-L-E. Thanks. Is it easy to get to by bus from Randwick? The 400 bus stops right outside the school where the course is held and the service runs until midnight. Great. One last question. 
My cousin's a pensioner. Would she get a discount? Yes, there's 20% off for full-time students or pensioners. She'll just have to bring her pension card to the first class. No problem. Speaking of cards, I've got my credit card here. I'd like to pay. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a museum guide talking to her tour group. First, you will have time to look at questions 11 to 15. Welcome, everyone. You are standing at the entrance of one of Britain's oldest and most prestigious museums, the National Art Museum. My name is Sarah, and I'll be your guide today. I hope you'll get as much enjoyment out of taking the tour of the museum as I will taking you on it. OK, let's get started then, shall we? Directly in front of you, where you came in, you can see the cafe. We'll have time to stop there for refreshments a little later, but for now we need to pass through it and make our way to the Renaissance Period Hall. Come along. Look here. There's a door at the back of the cafe, but we're going through the door on the left for the moment. Follow me. OK, our tour starts here, in the Renaissance Period Hall. But before we look at some of the wonderful works of art which adorn these walls, let's glance at the map of the museum and discuss the itinerary for the rest of the morning. We don't need to go back out through the cafe to get to the Classical Period Exhibition Centre. There's a door right here at the back of the Renaissance Period Hall, which leads right through. And that's our next port of call. Then we're going to leave the Classical Period Exhibition Centre and I'm going to take you back out through a doorway into the main corridor. There's a lovely exhibition of works by London artists dating from as far back as 1500 there. From the corridor, it's off to the information desk to pick up some leaflets for the next section we'll visit, the Albert Gallery. That's here, at the bottom left of the map as you look at it, and the entrance is just opposite the information desk. Behind the information desk, by the way, you'll find the men's and ladies, should anyone need to excuse themselves momentarily. Our last stop takes us back out into the main corridor, through the ticket office and into a very special section, which we only have the pleasure of seeing on account of the fact that we're on a guided tour, the restoration office. Here we'll be able to see professional restorers at work, delicately repairing centuries-old works of art, some of which are priceless. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Getting back to where we are right now then, look around you and behold the brilliance of the human mind, which seems to know no bounds. 
creatively speaking at any rate. We are surrounded by paintings from one of the most exciting periods of art history. The Renaissance was not just a revival, it was a reinvention of many artistic concepts. Study the painting to your left carefully. It's a self-portrait of Alberti, one of the pioneers of the Renaissance movement. Alberti did much to develop the understanding of perspective in art. It is no coincidence either that he was also a strong advocate of realism, since a thorough grasp of perspective and the optical considerations of creating a piece of art is a prerequisite for achieving an end result which is an accurate reflection of what the artist is trying to depict, which of course is a core aim of realism. Alberti regarded maths as the common ground of art and science and did much to promote the taking of a scientific approach among his peers. No more for his knowledge of theory than for his creations, Alberti was nonetheless an accomplished artist, sculptor, poet, author and linguist. He and his peers led Europe's awakening from a period of ignorance and intellectual poverty known as the Dark Ages. As a humanist, he advocated a wide, all-encompassing education curriculum which focused as much on culture and morality as it did on traditional fields of learning. He laid the foundations for a period of enlightenment and renewed intellectual vigour. Perhaps names such as da Vinci and Michelangelo are more synonymous with the period. And indeed, artistically speaking, these gentlemen undoubtedly achieved far more than Alberti ever did. However, his contribution should not be overlooked or dismissed lightly, for it was a catalyst for much of what was to come later, surpassing his own achievements. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a university lecturer and two students discussing an assignment. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 25. Come in, gentlemen. How can I help you? Good afternoon, Dr. Anderson. Chen and I are students in your research methods class, and we're having some problems with our assignment. Yes. You told me that on the phone. What was your topic again? Food issues related to living in space. What exactly are you finding difficult? We can't find much information, and our presentation's in two weeks' time. We've done all the usual things. Look online. Go to the library. We've even contacted the ESA. The European Space Agency? Yes, for its 2012 report. Well done. What have you learnt so far? Not much, I'm afraid. It's going to take three weeks for the report to get to us. Too late for our presentation. You can still use the data in your essays. By the way, how have you defined your topic? It needs to be clearer and more specific. I mean, food issues in space is a pretty big area. We've decided on the nutritional value of food and the cost of food. And food preferences, whether astronauts like chocolate or strawberry ice cream, for example. What about the social aspects? Can you sit down to a meal together in a rocket? Apparently, astronauts did in Skylab in 1973, and they do at the ISS, the International Space Station. We're focusing on the International Space Station rather than rockets. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, 
You have 30 seconds to read questions 26 to 30. All right. Now, you may not like this, but I find your considerations minor. Your research areas aren't that interesting or academic. How about looking into the future? How could agriculture, for example, be developed in space? Well, as far as we know, there's no planet in our solar system with an atmosphere suitable to sustaining life. That's any kind of life, human or plant. What about setting up an artificial environment? You might remember the experiments in greenhouse production here on Earth. There was a major one in Texas in 2006, and there's another underway in the south of England. The ESA should mention that. That's an idea. Of course, an alternative is importing food until a colony can produce its own. That's what I meant about the cost. Flying food into space is very expensive, not to mention all the waste produced. Around 25% of the weight of food products for astronauts at the ISS is packaging. OK. Why don't you examine the logistics of sending food into space and bringing back the waste? Do all the maths on it since you're engineering students. This could be interesting. I've seen a couple of articles already on feeding groups of people who are far from home. Like soldiers? Exactly. There have been lots of PhDs on the Vietnam War and food logistics. The use of container ships began then as a response to supplying so many men. Anyway, isn't it likely that moons or planets outside our solar system will be better for growing food? I think around 400 exoplanets are in the habitable zone, not too far for us to travel to. When might these be explored? We're still waiting for the ESA report. All right. I'd like you to spend tonight refining your research topic. Come back to me tomorrow. You've done some good work, but you need to focus. At this level of your studies, you should try to become experts. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. We'll see you tomorrow. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear part of a talk about how to attract birds to your garden. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. The best way to attract birds to your garden is by satisfying their basic needs, which are the need for water, the need for food, and the need for safety. Birds drink water and bathe in it, and many also use it to make mud to build their nests. A simple bird bath, which can be nothing more complicated than a shallow dish, will therefore attract birds. Don't use tin pans as these get hot under the heat of the sun. In fact, a cement bowl is probably going to be the most effective bath to use. 
but make sure that it is no more than 6.5 centimetres deep. The best time of all to attract birds to your garden, and indeed the time when they need your help most, is during the winter season. During summer, birds can find most of their food on their own and are largely self-sufficient. In winter, however, they benefit greatly from the help of their human friends. Often, when it is cold, an ice or frost crust may form over the ground, covering the bird's natural food supply. It is when this happens that they really need your help with feeding. It is probably best, though, to start feeding from late autumn onwards. That way, the birds will become used to finding food in a certain spot. So later, after the onset of the winter, they will become a permanent feature in your garden. Put food out at night so that the birds will find it the next morning. And whatever you do, make sure that you make your feeder accessible from a raised landing area only. Otherwise, you will find yourself attracting some unwanted pests such as rodents like mice and worse still, rats. Continue feeding until early spring, when food becomes plentiful again. If you cannot serve them insects, then try to give the bird suet, a form of beef fat. You can buy this cheaply at pretty much any meat market, so it won't cost you an arm and a leg. As well as being nourishing, suet also has the advantage of not freezing during cold weather. Many birds will also enjoy crumbs, nuts and seeds. You can even serve them boiled potatoes and hard-boiled eggs, provided these are finely chopped. Other foods you probably have lying around in your store cupboard may also be used. Try feeding them raisins, figs, dried fruit generally, biscuits, boiled rice and so on as well. If you want to build a birdhouse or nesting box, I would encourage you to proceed by all means. These offer fine protection, especially for the smaller and more vulnerable species. You can buy ready-made nesting boxes and shelves for a very reasonable price these days. Alternatively, if you fancy your hand at doing a little DIY, they are not very difficult to build either. Most birds prefer houses made of rough slabs of wood covered with bark, which to the birds feels quite authentic and natural. If at all possible, try to match your birdhouse to the surroundings as well. So, if you paint your birdhouse, be sure to use a dull grey-green or brown colour. The simplest type of birdhouse to construct yourself consists of a hollow branch nailed to a tree. When you are erecting your birdhouses, be sure to place them a good distance apart from one another. Few bird species enjoy nesting in close proximity to competitors of their own kind. Cleanliness is vitally important too. Your bird nest should be cleaned out yearly to make room for new nesting material to be brought in by their seasonal tenants. Early autumn is the best time to prepare your birdhouse as the new season's chicks will have hatched and flown the coop, so to speak. Once cleaned, your birdhouses will be ready to welcome their spring visitors once they return to your neighborhood early the next year. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.